han en hår i vårt våg och vinser på. Amen. So we find ourselves on the fifth Sunday of Great Lent, and for those who have been following the traditional fasting practices of our church, you will be at the point right now where you have probably consumed more vegetables and fruits than maybe you had the entire year before. Um, a time period filled with green and um, with wonderful um, fruits that we probably don't get enough of anyway. And I find it interesting as I go to the supermarket and I go shopping, the amount of time that I spend in the produce section versus the amount of time that I spend in other parts of the grocery store. Not even just during Lent, but in general. Um, the amount of attention that I need to place when picking out my fruits and my vegetables is a lot different than a pack of chicken, for example, right? When you're picking out produce, you need to make sure that there aren't um, any sort of defects on it, right? You want to make sure that um, it's perfectly ripe. It's at the right level, not too ripe or um, at the perfect place, right? The amount of time that you need to put. And so you do your visual inspection. I've seen some people even taking a piece of produce and smelling it. They want to see what it smells like before they put it into their cart. But what's interesting is even after going through this ordeal, going through the process of trying to inspect your produce, I don't know about you, but when you get home, it tends to be hit or miss as to whether or not it's a good piece of fruit or a good vegetable that you eat. That it can look perfectly good on the outside, a beautiful apple, and then you bite into it, and what happens? It's all mushy, even though it feels hard on the outside, or you bite into it and it has no flavor. It's amazing that modern scientists have perfected the way that our produce looks, but they yet have not found a way of perfecting the fruit itself. They can make the fruit look very good on the outside, enough so where you're going to go and you're going to buy it, but they haven't found a way to make sure that every time you bite into that apple, it's nice and sweet. In a sense, the outside of the fruit is made beautiful, but the inside remains rotten. It's very interesting, this process of buying produce. It makes me think of part of the Sermon on the Mount where Christ is warning people about pro false prophets, people that are going to come and they're going to pretend like they're serving God and that they're trying to spread the message of God, but he describes them as wolves in sheep's clothing. And he says the way that you're going to be able to tell these prophets um, the ones that are real versus the ones that are false. He says, you will know them by their fruits. Um, and he goes on to describe that a sound tree cannot bear evil fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will know them by their fruits. So essentially what Christ is saying is if you're not sure about um, someone, a preacher, a prophet of the faith, hang around them for a while and see how they behave, and you'll be able to tell very quickly by the way that they act, are they truly a prophet of God, or are they someone who's just trying to take advantage, a swindler? I find this interesting because in thinking about modern fruit, maybe um, Christ would have to update his image a little bit, because um, when we think about fruit like I just spoke about, um, sometimes you can't necessarily tell the fruit whether it's good or not by the outside. You need to bite into the middle of that fruit to know. So yes, you will know a tree by its fruits, but you cannot always tell whether a fruit is good or bad until you bite into it. And I think that this image of fruit, good fruit and bad fruit, is at the heart of today's Gospel reading. This image of two trees that bear fruit, right? How do you know if the tree bears good fruits or bad fruits, you need to look at the fruit. You need to examine the fruit. You may need to even bite into it to know. And so, who are the two trees that I'm referring to in today's Gospel reading? But we have a parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. You have two men that are bearing fruits, right? Um, and what Christ is almost implying in the Gospel reading without saying it is that both of these people are bearing bad fruits. Both of these people aren't really living up to the standard that they should. One of them, however, tries to pretend like his bad fruit is good fruit. And how does he do this? He says, look at me, look at how righteous I am, right? I do all these great things. I 
tithe. I give a tenth of all my income to the church. I fast twice a week. Look at me. Thank God I'm not like other people, like adulterers and extortioners, and even like this tax collector that's sitting over here, right? And yet, we know from the context that this man is projecting goodness when deep down he has wounds and he has insecurities and he has issues that he hasn't dealt with. Again, he's like that apple that looks green and beautiful on the outside, and when you bite into it, all you find is rot. The second tree, which also is a bad tree, is a little bit more honest, isn't he? And that is the tax collector. The tax collector is the one that's in the temple, and he realizes that before God, he is not worthy. And what does he do? He falls on his knees. He doesn't even look up to heaven, and he says, Oh God, have mercy on me, a great sinner. He acknowledges the fact that his fruit within his life is not good, that it's rotten. He's not trying to sell off his, good, his bad fruit as good fruit. He simply acknowledges the fact that he's broken and wounded, and that he needs to come to the farmer in order to get some healing. That his tree is not doing so well, and so he comes in front of God and says, Oh Lord, who is the farmer of my life, please do something. Put some fertilizer around me. Um, maybe water me or do whatever you need to do to help me begin to bear good fruit. And so what does Christ say, right? We have two bad trees. He says that the tree, though, that acknowledges his bad fruit, which is the tax collector, he went back to his house justified rather than the other. That so often it's important for us to address the problems in our lives and bring them before God if we ever expect any healing to take place. And so people often will misunderstand this parable and think that Christ is condemning um, the things that the um, Pharisee is doing, that the Pharisee is, um, that, that he's tithing, right, and that he's fasting, and that Christ is saying, oh, these things don't matter, just don't do them. That's not what Christ is saying. What Christ is saying here is that when you do these things, you need to do them in the right place. That you can't simply be concerned about outward appearances. You need to be concerned with your heart and the motivations behind what you are doing. And it's very interesting that our church actually specifically prescribes us to do the very things that the Pharisee, the bad guy in the story, does. Our church does prescribe that we fast two times a week on Wednesdays and Fridays. Our church's tradition is that we are supposed to give the first 10% of our fruits to the church, right? At a time when the church was the center of all social outreach, this is what people did. And so you didn't have to rely on any other organization for um, acts of charity. The church itself was the center of that. I think we're quite far away from that reality today, but just realize that the church in her tradition prescribes to do the very things that the Pharisee did. However, the way that the Pharisee did these things was the problem. And so the question becomes, when we're trying to work toward coming to God and when we come before him in prayer, are we coming forward to him honestly? Are we taking a real account of the fruit of our lives? Is our fruit good or is our fruit rotten? Does our fruit seem to be good? Do we do particular good things only to be seen by others or do we do them honestly because we're trying to do good for good's sake. And so, if we look at each of these practices, we can see the way in which these two practices in and of themselves are neutral. They can either be good or bad. But the way that we do them makes a difference. So I can either fast to show others my devotion to God, to try to show off, and, um, right, we do this all the time. Oh, what did you give up for Lent? What did you give up for Lent? And you have this long conversation about um, the thing that I'm doing to sacrifice for God. Well, is that really the purpose of what we're doing during Lent? Or is the purpose that I fast because I'm trying to learn to depend more on God than on the material comforts in the world? And that when I fast, I don't try to do it in a way that's showing off that I'm fasting. I'm doing it for myself and my relationship with God. I do it quietly. Right? How are we treating fasting? The one way can be 
actually more destructive than anything. It's almost better that you not fast if you're doing it to show off for others. But on the other hand, it is a good thing to fast. It's a good practice. Um, that discipline of being able to say no. In my times of, of struggle, I'm not going to go for that candy bar when I'm having a stressful day. Instead, I'm going to sit down and pray to God. A good practice, but it needs to be used in the right context. So is our fasting simply a, an apple that looks shiny on the outside but's rotten on the inside? Or is it truly a good fruit of our Christian life? The second example of what the Pharisee does, um, giving 10% of his income to the church, um, again, I think that that's a, a wonderful and a noble thing. But there's two ways that you might be able to give to the church or give to charity. You can either give for the purpose of being recognized by others. That you give for the purpose of getting your name on the plaque. Right? How many of us find that um, we give to particular organizations to get our names on a list? Is that really doing us any benefit? Or is that working against us? When I give money, am I doing it because I actually want to help the church in her mission? Or am I doing it to be recognized by others? The other way that I can give, rather than showing off, because honestly, we can even give, sometimes maybe we give because we want to show people how much money we have. That's a horrible reason to give. On the other hand, how can you give? You can give in a way where you do it quietly. You do it in a way that um, is simply for the sake of helping the organization you're giving to, and for the purpose of recognizing that when I give my money to the church, I'm simply giving back to God what's His already. That all that I have in my life is but a gift from God. And I am simply here in charge to be a steward over it, to be a caretaker of the gifts in my lives. And so when I go and I give a donation to the church or to a charitable organization, or I try to help someone out, I don't do it to say, look at me and how good of a person I am. I do it for the purpose of reminding myself that all that I have is His anyway. And so glory to God, I have the opportunity to give of this gift to others in need. Again, the same practice, but can have a radically different impact on our soul. And so I think in a sense, we are called to behave like the Pharisee, but we are called to do so with the heart of the tax collector. We're called to do the outward works that the Pharisee did, but do them with the heart of realizing our own brokenness and need for God. And I think that the only way for us to strike this balance is that we do all of these things prayerfully. That first and foremost, we come in honest prayer to God and put up to Him where we are in life, the struggles we're having, the things that are holding us back in our walk with Christ, and ultimately to ask Him for the strength to behave in a way that helps us walk toward Him. And so, may our Lord today help us to acknowledge the disease that might be within our own tree, right? The ways in which our tree might not be completely good. And may our Lord help us to heal from the wounds within our tree so that instead of producing a fruit that simply looks good, we can actually produce fruit that is good and that brings glory to God. And for this gift of being able to produce the fruits that feeds the people of God, we should constantly offer praise and worship and glory to Him with the Father and with the Holy Spirit, now and always and unto the ages of ages. Amen.